The harsh truth of the film industry is that movies are business investments. In the best case scenario, a movie thrills audiences and makes producers happier and wealthier. But sometimes a movie can be so bad, so bizarre, and so damaging to the reputation of a studio that the people in charge will willingly kill it, keeping it away from audiences and writing it off as a lost cause. Here are a few movies that if the studio had their way, the public would never, ever get to see. Here is entertainment, so refreshing, so heart-lifting, so satisfactual, you'll want to see it again and again. Rad. Released in 1986, Rad follows a young, unsigned BMXer striving to come out on top in the world's greatest off-road bike race. It's gnarly with a capital G, and its camp value is off the charts. Do you try to understand? The only thing I'm good at is riding this bike. Reviewers hated it, blaming stilted performances and a totally inexplicable plot. Viewers with a healthy sense of irony, however, can still find plenty to appreciate, like a scene in which characters take their bikes to the school dance and onto the dance floor. Rad may fail at what it's trying to do, but it goes above and beyond as a relic of its era, so it's well worth tracking down online or on unofficial DVDs. It was popular as a rental in the days of VHS, but the studio has all but abandoned it since. Unfortunate, considering its growing value as an examination of 80s culture at its most totally radical. Martin. One of the late George Romero's best and most interesting horror movies is also his hardest to track down. You can find a copy of Night of the Living Dead anywhere, but if you want to legitimately see Martin, you'll have to pony up for an out-of-print DVD or track down a bootleg copy. The story of a young man in Pittsburgh who may or may not be an ageless vampire, Martin is a movie that sticks with you. Its hero, who appears unsure as to whether or not he's a monster, is sweet and sympathetic, which makes the scenes of him drugging, cutting, and drinking the blood from people all the more disquieting. Don't be afraid. You'll just go to sleep. I don't have to hurt you now. It's not the quality of the film that keeps it out of viewers' hands, because it's actually pretty highly regarded among its fans. It's reportedly not available because the producer who owns the rights for its release simply wants too much money for it. It's a shame it's out of print because it's a unique, wonderfully crafted take on the vampire fable, and an example of how to remix old monster stories in a hauntingly effective way. The Last Movie there's a lot of interesting things going on in Dennis Hopper's second feature, 1971's The Last Movie. The problem is, they're not presented in an interesting way. You really can't fault Universal Pictures for burying this movie and never releasing it on DVD. Roger Ebert wasn't kidding when he summed it up as a wasteland of cinematic wreckage. It's even edited out of order to the point of incoherence. The title card for the movie doesn't appear until 26 minutes in. I want it legitimate and different and better than it's ever been done. A few viewings could help you cobble together the meaning of the movie, which follows Hopper's character as he goes native in Peru and contends with locals who can't tell that movies aren't reality. But it's a joyless, aggravating experience. Despite the criticism and the fact that the film's performance kept Hopper out of the director's chair for nearly a decade afterward, Hopper supported the movie up to his final days, screening it on his own while trying to secure a home video revival. Let It Be the film that captured the Beatles struggling to recapture their chemistry, Let It Be has developed a reputation over the years as a portrait of a band dissolving. In reality, it's not as explosive as has been implied, unless you were naive enough to think the bandmates never bickered. While it may have been a bummer at the time, the movie is an interesting, loosely constructed chronicle of the recording sessions leading up to their legendary final rooftop performance. It doesn't make anybody look good, but it doesn't make anyone look that bad either, and any Beatles fan is apt to find something intriguing in the film's many moments. Whether it's the implied drama of Yoko Ono lurking at the fringes of the studio, or the way the band lights up when it comes time to play some music, it's an intriguing document, with the rooftop performance serving as an unlikely swan song to one of the most successful musical runs of all time. So why hasn't it ever been released on DVD or Blu-ray? While it's consistently been suppressed through threat of lawsuit by its image-conscious cast, the reality today is that, for a layman audience, the movie's just not very good as a movie. It's got an aimless structure and lousy sound. It's a fans-only experience of a depressing time that a lot of casual music lovers probably wouldn't care to see. The Star Wars Trilogy in what is perhaps the biggest, strangest case of cinematic injustice on this list, the original three Star Wars movies, undoubtedly some of the most influential films of all time, are extremely difficult to find in their original form. For decades now, each release of the movie has shown incremental changes in their content, all in the name of moving, quote, closer to what's been called George Lucas's original vision. The most egregious examples of this cinematic revisionism were the Star Wars Special Editions released in 1997 in an overt attempt to replace rather than complement the trilogy. 
technology. As those special editions were developed, it became increasingly harder for actual original versions of the movies to be found. The shortage of official releases has led to fan edits of the special editions which keep the cleaned up visuals and sound while ditching the extraneous junk. The fact that fans have had to do this with some of the highest grossing, most culturally embedded movies ever is nothing short of absurd, and the day Disney releases the originals in a restored format will be cause for celebration. Speaking of Star Wars celebrations, the Star Wars Holiday Special With a legendary reputation in the world of bad entertainment, the Star Wars Holiday Special is so far afield from what makes the franchise great that it boggles the mind. Released after the success of the first movie, this largely plotless, overlong, ugly, and aggressively unentertaining slog poses itself as a variety show in space, which leads to surreal moments like B. Arthur singing to aliens in a cantina, and Wookiees watching what can only be described as holographic dance porno. I am your experience. I am so your experience. Me. So experience. I am your pleasure. This so is enjoy our me. It's frequently been reported that George Lucas has said if he had the time, he would destroy every copy in existence. And really, someone should have let him. Ironically or not, there's no fun to be had here. The Star Wars Holiday Special's biggest problem is that it commits the cardinal sin of the crappy movie. It's not just bad, it's boring, too. Where's Chewbacca? The Ewoks films. Less notorious than the despised holiday special, the Ewok films are interesting Star Wars apocrypha. They happen on a pretty faithful version of Endor, and actor Warwick Davis returns as Wicked, who made his first appearance in Return of the Jedi. The problem? Well, the Ewoks are more articulate than they were in Jedi, and hanging around with a stranded human family. We came on a star cruiser and we crashed. We crashed? Star cruiser? <laughs> star cruiser? Even less tolerable is the decidedly non-Star Wars plot turns both movies take. The first film, Caravan of Courage, includes a magical pond that traps people, bootleg-looking fairies made of light, and the unbearable moral message that love is the strongest force in the universe. What is this, Interstellar? Love, Tars, love. It's just like Brand said. My connection with Murph, it is quantifiable. Shut up. Anyway, Caravan of Courage's sequel, The Battle for Endor, immediately goes full oddball with the introduction of an evil, shape-shifting sorceress whose outfit looks like something the costuming department on Xena Warrior Princess would have rejected as too tacky. There's also a horrifying elf-like alien creature that lead actor Wilford Brimley's character lives with in the woods. Easy to make fun of, they're entertaining experiences if you watch with the proper mindset. But they're not actually good or interesting. Hey, even the prequels can't live up to that standard. The Carter this documentary is a fairly straightforward look at the life of the rapper Lil Wayne, recorded around the release of The Carter 3 in 2008. What makes The Carter such an interesting document is how revealing it is. It's remarkably unflattering to its subject, and the damage is all self-inflicted. Even as it demonstrates how talented the rapper is at what he does, Wayne's selfishness, self-destructive habits, and personal rudeness make him a very difficult figure to like. A look into the mind and life of an artist you would probably never want to meet, it's a great watch, and though it's been sporadically released on iTunes, it's currently not officially available, with legal challenges from Wayne's camp blocking the release of the film. Song of the South Though the notion that Disney's Song of the South takes place during the times of American slavery is a misconception, the reality isn't much better. This is radioactive material, and Disney's portrayal of the post-Civil War South as a chipper place where former slaves sit around singing songs all night feels like it's glossing over the big picture. The story of Song of the South is actually about a young white boy and his relationship with Uncle Remus, a former slave. In the film, the white people are without a doubt the bad guys and Uncle Remus is the hero. But none of that matters, because the setting is so jarring that it's not shocking at all that Disney doesn't want it to re-emerge as something people can buy. As of the making of this video, Song of the South has never been released officially on home video in the United States. In all likelihood, unless Disney experiences a drastic change in its artistic mission, it probably never will be. Glitterati Roger Avery's adaptation of Bret Easton Ellis's The Rules of Attraction is an underappreciated dark comedy bearing a loose and loopy structure filmed with daring stylistic touches. One of the more memorable sequences occurs in the middle of the film when a world-traveling character named Victor recounts his extensive European travels in a breathless, kinetic montage. Though the sequence barely lasts four minutes, Avery reportedly shot days' worth of footage for it, with Victor's actor staying in character as he takes drugs, seduces women, and otherwise behaves like the alpha and omega of the boorish American tourist archetype. 
Avery assembled this footage into its own movie called Glitterati, which is one of the more legendary, hard-to-see films from recent years, which author Ellis described as like a documentary with a fictional character in the middle of it. Lionsgate Films distributed the rules of attraction but not Glitterati, and the reasons come down to what is likely a combination of quality and legality. According to Ellis, for many legal reasons, it will never see the light of day. You can't really show Glitterati in public, it's not possible. There are a lot of people who would be very upset. Avery himself has called the process of making Glitterati insane and ethically questionable. To this date, he has only showed the film at screenings that he hosts, and the chances of that changing anytime soon are vanishingly small. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel, plus, check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.